I think, having created the last two videos about how one can push the technology of modern OSCs, that's one-shot color astrophotography cameras, to produce imagery that's as beautiful and almost as accurate as what can be found with mono cameras using filters, that it might be a good time to go ahead and perhaps dispel one of the more long-running myths about mono cameras versus one-shot colors. And the myth is the notion that in the realm of astrophotography, the green channel on a color camera is not really doing anything. It's relatively useless. Now, the myth is based on the reality that color cameras create their color by dividing light through what's called a Bayer matrix, which is a filter that lays over the monochrome sensor of a color camera. And the Bayer layer pre-filters light into red, green, and blue. You might think of it as the pixels are divided up into groups of four, like squares. And in a group of four, you will typically see a, a red pixel, two green pixels, and a blue pixel. So because most objects in space look to be red or blue, and we almost never see the color green, the idea has come to run rampant, to be frank, in the astrophotography community that those green pixels are not doing anything. That they are essentially just wasted pixels. And this is because there are very few green objects to be found in space. So the idea came about, perhaps naturally, that if you use a color camera, which has one quarter of the pixels devoted to red, one quarter of the pixels devoted to blue, and half the pixels devoted to a green channel, then half your pixels are not being used. Now I want to take a moment to uh, show you something that's very important here. This is an image of M20, the Trifid Nebula. I shot this about two weeks ago during four beautiful nights of clear weather. Now I'm in PixInsight and I'm just going to use the screen transfer function to do a quick stretch onto the object. I'm not actually going to change the image itself. Just going to stretch it so that you can see M20. To the left is an open star cluster, but we're not going to use it for our purposes in this demonstration. Now what I'm going to do is divide the channels apart with a PixInsight tool called Channel Extraction. It's very easy to use. Just run it on the image and it will pull apart and separate the information from the red, green, and blue color channels. Note at this point, I have made no changes whatsoever to this image. This is basically the raw, well, this is the raw image. The only thing I have done is pulled apart the red, green, and blue channels. And now I'm using the screen transfer function to do a quick histogram transformation on each image so that we can see the data hidden within. Top left, you're seeing the green channel. There's a lot of data in the green channel. In fact, in a paper that I'll link below that was published in a Royal Astronomy Society of Canada medium, it was noted that as much as 70% of luminance data in color cameras was on the green channel. The chart you are presently seeing is taken from that paper. This happens because green is not a primary color. It is comprised of other colors blended together. And the green channel, on many sensors anyway, extends to frequencies into the red and down into the blue, so there is a great deal of crossover. Even the frequencies associated with the narrowband imagery cross over into the green channel on the sensors of many cameras, as you can see in the chart above. So back to our images, let's compare what's on the green channel with the red and blue. The green channel is the image portrayed upper left, and the red and blue channels will be portrayed on the right. The red channel has lots of light, lots of data, but it's somewhat diffuse. The blue channel has more focused data, though not quite as bright as the green channel. Now, having spoken with the author of the paper, what I've come across is some of this data is interpolated, but most of it is actual light data caught on the green channel. And it is caught on the green channel, partly because the green channel crosses over into both red and blue, or I suppose you could say the red and blue channels cross partly over to green. Let's go ahead and take a look at the light patterns of some other deep sky objects that I photographed with an OSC or one-shot color camera over time. This is the Bubble Nebula, NGC 7635. Noted for its beautiful bubble formation in the middle, it is a nebula with a lot of red color. And when we look at the color image in the red channel, we can see a predominance of red energy, or red signal. And if you look on the right, you can see the green channel. There's a lot of signal there, even though the majority of this nebula signal is in the red band, therefore on the red channel. And as before, we see that the green channel provides not only a lot of luminance, but a lot of sharpness. The red channel is always kind of blurry because that light frequency has a lot of wavelength. This next image is NGC 5457, the Pinua Galaxy. Like a lot of us, I decided to shoot it last month due to the supernova in its outer arm. 
Notice here that the Galaxy presents almost an even amount of lighting in each of its channel, because as I was telling you earlier, stars and galaxies are vast clusters of stars are continuous spectrum emitters. They emit light across all the visible spectrum. Now the important take home here is that once again, the green channel of an OSC, a color camera, is not going to waste. In point of fact, that green channel would only be going to waste if you tried to use a color camera like a monochrome camera that is using something like narrowband filters, a tremendous technology for monochrome cameras that can be used but isn't so great with OSCs. So how is it that the myth has come to be in astrophotography that the green channel goes to waste? I think because the bare layer is made of red, green, and blue, we sometimes forget that green is not a primary color. The primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And green, falling in the middle, encompasses everything between red, yellow, and blue. And because there is no such thing as color, therefore colors are somewhat arbitrary, they're just perceptions that exist in our minds, we also may overlook that on camera sensors, or at least in the bare layer, there can be a great deal of overlap between red and green and blue and green. So this means that your sensor is picking up to red light and blue light, but it is also picking up to green light and some of that green light is even included on the red and blue channels and vice versa. And if we take this logic a step further, what it means is that the green channel on astrophotography cameras on any camera pointed at the stars absolutely is not going to waste. Now, in discussing this with some persons I know who do narrowband photography, they have told me monochrome sensors are much better at picking up the lights emitted by narrowband filters. And that's accurate. Narrowband photography is a technique of photography that was designed and created for monochrome cameras. And for monochrome sensors, it works great. And I'm not here to argue that monochrome sensors or color sensors are superior one to the other. Because depending on what you're doing, you can get incredible results with either. What I am going to tell you is that narrow band does not work well with color sensors because narrow band is a technique made specifically for monochrome cameras. If you want to get the best out of a color sensor, then you have to play to its strengths and evolve to use techniques for color cameras. One of the advantages of the color sensor is that it can do a lot of work for you at once, including capturing multiple colors. So to make best use of it, you should be using dual or tri-band filters. These filters will let two or more specific frequencies of light through, and a color camera is capable of catching them all at once. And those green pixels in the middle? They're not going to waste. They are catching everything that is any little bit of a blend between red and blue, which is almost everything. So sometimes hardcore narrowbanders will argue that the bare layer will decrease efficiency of light transmission. And I won't argue with that, that's true. But you also gain an awful lot by shooting with a one-shot color camera. For example, you're not losing time during the night when you're shooting changing filters, which also requires refocusing. You can shoot all night with whatever dual or triple band filter you have chosen to use. And in the morning, you don't need to spend nearly so much time making calibration frames. Monochrome cameras need calibration frames for each filter. One-shot colors only need calibration frames for the one filter they used. And of course, if you're shooting a color image, and let's say it gets cloudy during the night and you can't shoot for as long as you had hoped, you can use the data that you got. You have a complete image right there ready to go. Now, one of the biggest arguments for the use of monochrome cameras is that a monochrome camera is able to use 100% of its pixels at all times, including especially when using narrowband filters. And that is absolutely true. But what gets lost in this is that, as we've just discussed, the green pixels of an OSC are not really going to waste. I mean, they'd only be going to waste if you're using narrowband and only if the narrowband allowed no crossover onto the green channel. Those green pixels are otherwise still catching data. And in Brian McDonald and Jason Dane's article, which I've cited below and previously, they note in their paper that while monochrome sensors make a bit better use of the light, it's not by much, not enough to be noticed by the eye. So once again, we have to ask for non-scientific purposes, is it worth the trouble? Another thing that I've heard brought up a lot is you have to shoot narrow band if there is a moon, if there's light pollution. Now, to be honest, I have no personal way to experiment with urban light pollution. I know a lot of you folks live in areas with lots of light pollution. I live in the Canadian backwoods and I'm in a border one area. I've lived in wilderness areas like this pretty much all my life. 
So I just can't speak with any real meaningful experience about shooting within city light pollution. But I can tell you that defenders of narrowband keep telling me, well, you can't use dual band filters, tri band filters and OSCs under the full moon. And I can absolutely positively guarantee you that's nonsense. And you know how? Because the image of the turfid nebula that you have been looking at, a shot during a night of a three quarter moon. And here's an image of Bodes in the Cigar Galaxy, which I shot during a night I don't remember exactly was greater than a 95% full moon. And the sky was pretty bright with moonlight. So how did I do it? I just had a ZWO dual band filter in front of my sensor. I kind of like it when people tell me you can't do this, that or the other thing, because I can guarantee you I'm going to test that theory. And I tested the theory and the statement that you can't shoot in moonlight with an OSC is nonsense. You just use the right filter for the job. And yes, you most certainly and absolutely can. So anyway, that's about it. Now, I don't claim to know everything about photography, not even close. And if you see or hear anything here that you feel is absolute idiotic nonsense, please tell me. But I'll tell you, my approach to all of this is very practical. And well, I spent about a quarter of my life in university studying the sciences. And in science, we look at proof. There's theory and there's proof. If the proof doesn't prove the theory, we discard the theory, not the proof. And the proof is in the images I've been shooting. And the simple proof is by applying the new and powerful noise removal techniques and new and powerful filters such as dual and tri-band filters and new and powerful camera technology, we can push color cameras in all kinds of amazing ways that can accomplish what until not too long ago was strictly the domain of monochrome cameras and narrowband imaging. I know these last couple of videos have ticked off some people. Sorry about that. I don't mean them to. But to me, that some persons have been ticked off by this is absurd. Technology marches on. The way we do astrophotography is changing rapidly all the time. When I was a kid, we were struggling along with film and terrible tracking systems. Now we have wonderful computerized guiding and PhD2 and applications like Nina. And camera technology is also getting better all the time, as well as the applications that we use to process the imagery. Technology is just marching on. So being upset about these results, to me, it's like being upset that your computer is going to eventually need to be upgraded. Technology marches on. It is just going to happen. Now, does this video in any way mean that I think there is no more place for monochrome and narrow banding? Absolutely not. Narrow band gives beautiful results in specific areas. And it is a great way to filter out the background and really just focus on perhaps oxygen or sulfur, nebulous details and such that you might want to get. And if I were shooting for scientific purposes, I would very likely use a monochrome camera to capture every last bit of detail possible in the light. That's why NASA puts monochrome cameras on things like the Juno probe or the James Webb telescope. But if I'm just shooting photography or even if I'm shooting for a scientific purpose and I don't need that specific degree of detail, I'm going to march on with the technology, make life easier for myself and use a color camera. And frankly, I'm, I'm glad that color cameras have come into their own the way they have. I'm glad that the need for cooling seems to be going the way of the dinosaur. I'm glad for modern sensors that suppress amp glow and dead pixels so effectively and get rid of the need for shooting things like dark frames because this makes astrophotography cheaper, which makes it more accessible to everybody and everybody should have access to it. It should not be just the domain of persons who have disposable income. And it's good for anyone who has disposable income too, because as more persons get access to it, more companies will make hardware to do astrophotography and software, which means there'll be more technological development. The field will advance faster and further. We'll be able to accomplish more and the overall cost will become less for everyone. So anyway, that's about all I have to say. And to recap, the myth that the green channel on a color camera, color astrophotography camera is doing nothing is just that. It's just a myth. There is no more validity to it than the myth of the boogeyman. Don't feel that your color camera is letting you down. Instead, learn how to make the best use out of that color camera and it will amaze you.